The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. And now, here he is, Brandon. Welcome back to the Brandon Peters Show. Today, we once again open the gateway to hell for another entry in the products of the Panic series, which means my brother in darkness, Troy Bramfield of the Saturday Evening Post, is back. Greetings, Brandon. Which I, I believe some of your readers have given you feedback that you should burn in the hell that we love. <laughs> Over ties. Right? Right? Over ties, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the... Um... If you've never seen, um, in the Saturday Evening Post, we have a contrarian column that runs in the magazine and we'll have installments online. And the one that I got the most vicious feedback on was maybe it's time to get rid of the tie. Handwritten, well, right? People not like that. Handwritten, right? <laughs> my, my favorite one that I have uh, used as the cover image on my Facebook is a guy hand wrote me a letter to vent his displeasure over this particular article on his resume. <laughs> I have no idea what that was about because he's not a writer. He's a financial guy. So it and wasn't a clever way of like, Hey, like I could do this better. No, it was it wildly scribbled as if it the throes <laughs> of vicious anger. And oh. I mean, it is, it is hilarious, but, and, and there were some other angry ones but you know you you expect some of that with those i expected mm -hmm. it to be a discussion i didn't think i was gonna get hate mail over <laughs> but and you weren't wrong problem. like who like i always decide like who decided like the tie like they used to do it because the collar wouldn't stay they did th like who decided like that someone just one day said that's that's what's nice you know like that's oh. literally <laughs> Yeah, I, I've always thought it was an inherently ridiculous kind of thing. There's the the napkin part of it that evolved from wearing the, yeah. the the 16th century banquets and stuff. But really, when you got to anything approximating the late 20th century, the fact that the, the power suit and all this other yeah. stuff was just, I mean, it, it's fundamentally silly. It's, it's, uh, I am important cosplay. It's, yeah, like, just, why not dress for comfort? Yeah, it was like remember the dress for the job you want to have. I'm like, cool, because I wear a hoodie and t-shirt all <laughs> the time. Man. Like, thank you. <laughs> like, that's yeah, it's, it's silly, and, and it presupposes that you can only do your best work when you're in a button-up shirt and every it just all these jobs that you have that people are expected to dress up or at least make a pass at it, like teaching and whatnot. Yeah. And they're all predicated on why don't you be even more uncomfortable while you do all this stuff? Many of those who follow that probably had an interest in a book that we're going to be talking about today, which is the source of the 2003 documentary, Satan Wants You. Um, you have heard the title of this book all through the way, all the way back to cult cinema cavalcade. Uh, Michelle Remembers, which is a, is a novella uh, that... Uh, <laughs> sparked the entire satanic panic of the 1980s and the world we still live in today. Sign A, November 1976. Let it come as much as you can. I, I couldn't get away. I couldn't even get away. Joining me now 
Back from Victoria is Michelle Smith, a one-time victim of abuse by a satanic cult, and Dr. Lawrence Pazder, the psychiatrist who helped her come to terms with that nightmare. The book is called Michelle Remembers. Michelle Remembers. We wrote it, we wrote together. it together. The first publicized account of such rituals. They would put me in cages, sacrifice animals, eating feces and orgies and dismembering fetuses. These were things that you experienced. That's right. Who are these people? Well, they're a secret organization. They're a secret society. When that book came out, I mean, all hell broke loose. It was a theory that there's a satanic conspiracy and there are children who are kidnapped, stolen, and sacrificed. It's known as the satanic panic from the 1980s and 90s. I consulted on hundreds of these cases all over the Western world. There are thousands of men and women who are secretly worshipping the devil. Are you accusing me of being a Satanist? I know you murdered babies, and I know you made me murder babies. More than 300 counts of sodomy, rape, and oral copulation. So many different kinds of people believe that this was happening. It was dead serious. There were people who went to jail. It's very hard to believe. There are too many people telling too many stories for this not to be true. And all of this was started by this book. You're not the psychiatrist to me. <laughs>
with Michelle remembers, I'm not sure how much of this is contractual or how much of this is it's taking, you know, such the beating over the years for people discovering it was bullshit and all the things that went along with it that nobody wants to touch it. It's kind of radioactive. I'd be interested if if we did a search on all the different books we've referenced to like Satan's Underground, because we know yeah. everything that happens with Laurel Rose Wilson, too, or uh, Mazes and Monsters. Mm hmm. You know these books uh, that that all factor in. I wonder what's happened to to That's all true. Of, all of those, because even the people like us who are interested in the topic and everything, we don't really want to own those books. <laughs> we don't want to. I feel like they were like kind of trashy books to begin with. When the yeah. I like what the vibe I get from this documentary is, we were just amplifying trash, like ignorantly as a media culture. Yeah. Like we were just like. And it was le and because and this was that this was during a time where people just believed what they saw on TV. Just now they like now they believe what they see on the internet. And yeah. people remember they used to say, you can't believe everything you see on TV, ah, or you believe everything you know. And then like, but people do, and people believe the internet as well, especially in a social media culture where. Well, I know Jojomo, and Jojomo shared that, and Jojomo's uncle shared it before him, or they shared that, but they never look at it. it was at like Iron Cross Eagle Loves Troops dot com reports, you know <laughs> that thing. So the, it, it's real weird, but I feel like it kind of felt like watching this was like it was always trash, and like many were onto its bullshit early, but it lasted over a decade crazy yeah. it this is i we'll we'll get into it a little further but mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's a problem here with trying to figure out motive in a way because michelle smith in the documentary and in all these interviews um i'm going to make a really obscure reference uh, she, she reminds me of Alma Mobley from Ghost Story, the book, not the movie, where the person is an empty shell that's a reflection of all these other things around them. Okay. The the reason that the Eva Gali incarnation didn't become a film star in silent movies is because people found something that repelled them in a way. Mm -hmm. in, in these interviews and whatnot, she never comes across as like a real super sympathetic figure. She comes across as very emotionally blank and emotionally blank, but like ruthless too. Like I, yeah. I I'm going to, I'm going to stick my course. Like, so yeah, the way they kind of paint this is like, Oh yeah. Don't lo Don't get us wrong. She is Darth Vader, but Dr. Pazder's the emperor. Like, that's kind of how they, like, she is evil, but she's not the biggest of, you know. And I'm not even sure game. that that's true is <laughs> either. I mean, there, there's definitely a, a bringing out the worst of each other mm -hmm. quality. But, you know, her family still loved her, even though, well, yeah, gentle viewers, we'll get back to explain. But, you yeah. Know, her mom and her sister and everything, they never abandoned her and any of this stuff. No, they, they, and, they're trying to get her to like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> whereas Pazder loses his whole original family. Yeah. And, and everything pays this diabolical cost for this, dare I say, deal with the devil. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. All right, so, so shot. Okay, let me let's paint a picture here. So, this documentary focuses on Michelle remembers and around it what it caused through the 80s. They don't call it the sole thing for the satanic panic, but they do consider it a giant spark, uh, that spawned these things. They it's go, the spirit of the satanic panic, right? Yeah, there, there you go. Um, yeah, Nick Martin trials was uh, Soundgarden. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, so you get the history of Michelle, doc, and this Doctor Pastor, who were the ones who that was her. It was her psychiatrist. 
um, Michelle went to see him and through the process that involved hypnosis, he was able to pull childhood memories of her that her mother was involved in the satanic cult. They did ritualistic abuse, the term they invented, um, uh, satanic ritualistic abuse. And she was kidnapped for like 81 days, was it? Like a 14-month span where they did nothing but bad to her. Um, and he brought it out of her. They wrote a book. They shocked the world. And all of a sudden, now this is happening all throughout the world. Uh, this is a damning thing on psychiatry practices that were forcing things out of people, making people think they, you know, and people going along with it. There's opportunists in this. It's not all on the psychiatrists. Um, they bring in her family. She has a sister that's here being interviewed. Dr. Pazder's ex-wife and one of his children's interviewed. Uh, Michelle's best friend is here to be interviewed. She did not interview. Dr. Pazder is fucking dead. Um, and then they have some journalists that work the time. And then they have like a historian, um, which the historian, uh, what is her name? It was, um, I can't remember her name. Uh, I wanted more of her because she, yeah, she opens up the thing and then kind of just like pops back in randomly. But I feel like I wish she would have been the drive driver of this whole thing. Yeah. There, there's a one note that, um, you know, the, the, two directors are canadian mm -hmm. and there's a little bit more of a canadian perspective which <laughs> michelle was canadian right that's right. How, yeah right with then american because i think had it been american filmmakers you would have had a lot more about mcmartin and so forth because we felt this <laughs> reflection <laughs> funny enough the woman's name that i couldn't remember sarah marshall which forgetting sarah marshall how'd you is forget a, it yeah how'd i forget it Crime scene, scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, continue. That uh, so I I think it, which which is not a, a knock on these guys because it's extremely interesting that they decided to make this documentary and were able to get you know Pazder's ex wife and all mm -hmm. these people signed on board. You know, good for them for getting it out there in in the world. Because I never thought I'd see anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Saying Canadian makes me realize, okay, that would explain some of the, the kindness with how this is approached. It's it's kind of yeah. polite. Like, I wanted it to go a little harder. And I feel like there was a lot of loose thread missing opportunities to where they could have built this parallel around today's sort yeah. of events, which they use more of a brush upon epilogue yeah. than it could have been showcasing there could have been a parallel to this but it is kind of i will say i enjoyed it quite a bit i called it i did think it was kind of soft but now that you yeah. say canadian production i'm like okay well a bit polite yeah and and so it it, it i just thought it was interesting and, and it might explain the kindness also some of the football shaped heads but yeah <laughs> uh, the, the honestly the as Brandon was saying, you know, they had this whole thing of the SRA is what they abbreviated to the satanic mm -hmm. ritual abuse, which Pazder coins and the book. And then it's before it comes out, there there is the kind of pre-release fervor you would associate with a much anticipated biography, right? Like whatever mm -hmm. there's a new jackie kennedy book or something they're always going to run excerpts of people or whatnot well this is being excerpted in places like the national Enquirer, <laughs> and, right and other magazines as it's as it's rolling up they said and, two of them really ran with it one was the Enquirer, and the other was like a reputable source like two of them were running it and then it's like the Enquirer. i'm like okay what was the inquire before this? Was inquired shit before this, or did this turn them into a complete shit storm? I think it was always shit. But it was shit. Okay. <laughs> I I think there there were there was a kind of a three headed monster of the inquire the star and the weekly world news, mm -hmm. and weekly world news was the black and white bat boy one that you knew right. that was always just crazy. 
And the Inquirer and the Star tried to present a sheen of realistic stuff. They did a lot of celebrity gossip and everything. They still do, but I think that's mostly retreated to the internet and whatnot. But with, with the Inquirer, which is still a publication because I looked them up the other day, pursue it to something because they've had a lot of political involvement. Are they still in print? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. But um, with with respect to this, you know, they, they ran these excerpts. They also ran a uh, trailer for a future bit. Um, lots of stories about Ed Lorraine Warren. Yeah. <laughs> doing, doing ghost busting. But uh, my first encounter with this story mm -hmm. happened about the time that the book was coming out because I remember reading one of these tabloid excerpts because oh. my grandmother was a big tabloid getter. Oh, so yeah. my, my, my grandmother liked them too. She liked the Inquirer. And and so I I remember reading Troy remembers, Michelle remembers. Because <laughs> I remember reading these things and like the what the hell of it, you know, when you're right. like eight ish. And uh because that'll stick with you. But the <laughs> the stuff that happens very quickly is the talk show appearances and the broader news context this was covered as legitimate news mm -hmm. on legitimate news and talk programs and then the more sensationalized talk programs and when when the 80s start there's really only a handful of these talk programs you've got donahue oprah doesn't come along till the mid 80s a lot of these others don't explode until the mid 80s so you have this this uh Donahue, PM Magazine, some of your local little news shows and stuff, but they all start doing things on Michelle Remembers. 2020, they oh, all yeah. these start picking it up, and it becomes a very big thing. And it's hard to say um, how some things catch on in the imagination of a public and some don't <laughs> yeah but but this one started to catch on and as we've talked about the panic before it merges with this kind of white middle class parental fear and discontent over things like dungeons and dragons and heavy metal and uh the boom and horror novels that was going on in the 80s and all this other stuff kind of mixes and it takes a while for the piggyback things to start to occur which are built off of michelle remembers but then you start getting the other cases and then really um mcmartin is a big flashpoint when you start to have not just a person saying this happened to them but people coaching children into saying it happened to them at a daycare or a school or scouts or whatnot and it's well I goes will, mushroom i will say things with like being a because we're different ages but uh, growing up as a kid in the in the 80s like scary stuff was a lot scarier because there was an amplification about satanism in like the news on commercials and all this stuff so everything Everything spooky or horror or metal related was like had an extra layer of scary to it because of the adults in the room were like, this is bad or oh, yeah. this. Is... And so it had an ample, it, it added, it made, made someone like me more curious, but there was a, a, a different a feel to it that's just like silly to think of now, but like something like a Stephen King commercial for his books was like, satanic <laughs> it was yeah well they you know they there was definitely a a presence of of pushing that because and, and we talked about this before but in the political situation of the time um it, this happened to fit perfectly with the 1979 jerry falwell founded the moral mm -hmm. majority which would get behind Republican Christian conservative candidates and whatnot, and they would get fully in bed with Reagan and run some really terrible ads about Jimmy Carter 
and so forth, accusing him because he's a Democrat. He's no longer a Christian and all this stuff that they ran these ads in the South. But um, these groups were legitimized in a way by Reagan letting them in. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and you look, you know, Nixon was a Quaker. He wasn't letting them in. Well, and, uh, like <laughs> right around the turn of the 70s and stuff, they, religion was on its way out as a whole in the United States. Yeah, we, the kind of environment in which your row is codified. Um, there, the cover of Time Magazine is God dead. You know these these things were happening in the late sixties, early seventies, mm -hmm. and then there's this big boom of conservatism that these things like Michelle Remembers were prompters to pick out fresh targets. And so the horror stuff, the metal stuff, <laughs> these all become, you know, cannon fodder. Yeah. And a lot of these bands were completely caught off guard by it because I, I think most of them would say we were just being eighties, Alice Cooper, man. Yeah. We were right. just the, the next level of this. I think when, you know, Motley Crue did not, do shout at the devil and then go back to the Motley Crue satanic compound and sacrifice fans. They were, no. that, you know, they, Nikki six and set himself on fire on stage. They'd be like, great. Good night. And, you know, they were iron maiden was so know, many, so many people and children died in the eighties that through ritual sacrifice that just insane. No name people. Yeah. And, and yeah, we were, were there people missing? Did children get kidnapped and children die? Yes. Adam Walsh, for example. But not in the numbers that they would have you believe based on the stuff that the SRA people are saying. Yes. <laughs> You'd have to have a million people go missing every couple weeks. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we go, I mean, we go through the, 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 Beginnings of this, we have Michelle's friend, um, something Weaver or Wheeler on here, who's just, it's like, really, ma'am? Like, like, I, they're, they've, they've decided their job is to believe everything that, the, uh, that Michelle said completely unquestioned. Yeah. She says, like, she like knows her friends a piece of shit opportunist and refuses to give up or like or say anything bad. She's like, I do believe something happened to her, and it was a group of Satanists. And then she talks about like at the the funeral for Doctor Pazder, she walked outside and a deer st stared at her. She said that was like the spirit of him telling me to watch over her. He's like, she's a good person. Like, no, um, she uh. She not only did this, she wrecked a marriage intentionally. Like, yeah. Um, uh, because like it starts, so they get married, and it's like a real secretive thing to people. Like the press tour doesn't know of it, and th there's a lot of people. Like they kind of say the thing that um, they uh, Michelle stops wanting to do press and stuff once they're married comfortably and stuff like. So it was like, was she just feeding into what he wanted? And then once she got what she did, she was done. Like it, it does present kind of that way. But and then the there's the other side of that coin is when they have the initial burst of fame from the book, mm -hmm. they then become quote unquote expert witnesses for these other trials. Right, yeah. They've triggered. With, and she's with, on TV. No. They they have interviews of her on TV talking about other things. And oh, well, this is what they do. This is what they want. Like, okay, yeah. And and as we referred to in the McMartin episode, they come in as expert witnesses mm -hmm. in the McMartin episode. Yeah. So between Fee McFarland and her dolls and Pazder and Smith, it, it's very much a circus behind the scenes, with oh. no one advocating for the kids really. Yeah. The most bizarre thing is that they have a they have a clip from this in here is the game show. <laughs> like who right. would do that with all that trauma and stuff? Why would you? Like no serious person on this is like I I get today's culture in the social media. Look at me, I need you know the clicks and stuff. Someone doing that, but back in then, like. 
that should have been your question right there. Like, what are these two fuckers doing on a game show? Like, <laughs> she had rich, she had ritualistic abuse when she was. Uh, uh, which one is she? You know, like, yeah, I like what, and she's all like, "It's Lady Michelle." I remembered, like, no, no, <laughs> like next uh, on season six 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 of Dancing with the Stars. Exactly. Michelle. Yeah. What the, like, I yeah. Ooh, like that's really, really crazy. Um, they, I mean, another clip they have on here is Oprah when they're on there and unquestioning will not. Nope. Oh yeah. This it, is all real. Oprah has done a lot of good in her life. She has put a spotlight on a lot of causes that needed a spotlight. She mm-hmm. has given away many blenders under these seats. Yes. But <laughs> this episode is one of the worst things that she ever, she has both Michelle Smith and Laurel Rose Wilson is sitting right. on the episode together. And the, like you said, completely and quite everything is presented as a hundred percent true. Not, not just no hard questions, not really any right questions. There's just zero pushback of, of of any kind they're just allowed to go out there and this is when it was almost over too this is like yeah. 89 i mean it's a last gasp kind of thing in a way but this is when geraldo's doing his special too <clears throat> excuse me but damn what a awful thing to do yeah and i'm still you know if you want to talk about other stuff yeah she stuck us with Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz and other shit. <laughs> um, th- this is a horrible example of the worst of anything that purports to be journalism. Right. No, it does. And you know, the funny thing is, this is all quickly debunked by um, Dr. Pazder's wife, who gets pissed off. I was like, all right, let's go see about this woman. And then does two seconds of research by going and like, oh, there's no record of her disappearance. There's no record. Here she is on this day um, where she claims she was, you know, gone, like, two no seconds to look absences. it up. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is, like, there's the FBI guy that's like, I didn't take it seriously because it was all, like, bullshit. And, like, yeah. And he's like, and he's like, the problem, he said the problem is, um, and I'm in the FBI. I'm trained to believe everyone's guilty until brought with substantial evidence. Whereas a psychiatrist is trained to believe everyone unless the circumstantial evidence is there. Yeah. And, and it and, is interesting because uh, the guy's name eludes me at the moment, but that one cop that mm-hmm. Maury Terry, writer of the ultimate evil completely convinces that his whole, every serial killer in America is part of a network of satanic serial right. killers together. That one cop was 100% all in and he said, we've tried to prove Maury Terry right. And of course, no one ever did because he's not. But <laughs> the the this FBI guy is the, the wonderful striking counterpoint to that. This <laughs> is not the guy that's out teaching cops. This is how you recognize satanic, you know. Cases. Right. Because that was also going on in the 80s. Part of this, as this stuff starts happening, they're like, we better create some task force. So these Yeah, they have the seminars, they have the training video, they have Cops for Christ. Yep. Yeah. And there's other journalists, too. There's one that says, you know, going against it, that was one of them at the time. He's like, look, he's like, I don't have a problem with Christianity. I have a problem with churchianity. It's a business. Like, it's one of the things he, he brought to the table. But, like, yeah. Um, I mean, there's also like the Church of Satan, which is mentioned in the first uh, editions of, well, those probably go for a pretty penny. The first editions of Michelle Remembers, um, which they then sue them for libel and then have to remove Church of Satan's references from her book. So, right. So, uh, hmm. Wrong denomination, Michelle. Yeah. Funny <laughs> how they got organized. Yeah. And, but, that is a kind of a classic misstep because anytime you, like you said, you made the denomination joke there, but mm-hmm. if, if you get into the specific denomination, 
they're going to be organized with legal representation. <laughs> right. Yeah. And acting like Church of Satan is just an amorphous thing out there that's not. No, oh, they've got offices. <laughs> they got lawyers. <laughs> they'll, right. They'll get you. Um, because, I mean, it, let's be fair. If somebody's going to have lawyers, it's going to be a Church of Satan, right? Yeah. Right. Right. right yeah. <laughs> but no, seriously. The, by, you know, by all that implication, these guys are also not dummies. They know it's all bullshit too. Mm -hmm. So their way by, by suing, not only are they taking their name out of her mouth, but they're also, yeah, why don't you prove it? Yeah. Show us what you got. There's, yeah. There's not. <laughs> and when they, with the church of Satan, what people realize is like, it's like not religious stuff in the church of Satan. It's all atheistic and stuff. So they're probably in a legal case, bringing actual, stuff not thoughts feelings ideas and faith they're bringing like factual things they've done like factual stuff that they can back up in the physically past decade yeah the past decade or so i can't think of an entity that has done more for first amendment case law than that yeah yeah they have really pushed back on the 10 commandments in public spaces all these ever, mm -hmm. other things that the right thing, statue the, the okay we get a statue approach has really foiled a lot of this stuff right and a lot of it the origins you can kind of clearly see here too like dr pastor he's this devout catholic like an uber catholic and he goes to like on this trip to nigeria where nigeria's like get the fuck out of here he sees some imagery and he goes on some sort of crazy holy mission that he's basically Painting a world to exist in and then taking a major role in it. Like he's crafting this world he wants to believe exists and doesn't happen. And then there's part like there's a TV movie with Sally Field based on a thing uh, called Sybil, which kind of is a psychiatry a movie based on like a uh, psychiatrist pulling some abusive mother stuff out of a, a woman, like suppressed memories of that. At the same time, the exorcist comes out and he kind of, puts those two together with Michelle and then Michelle fucking buys into it because she has a, a hankering for this guy that she's spending time with in psychiatry and probably is like, yeah, I'll go with all this shit as long as I spend time with him and he leaves his wife for me. Yeah. And some of the stories that Michelle recounts are just versions of customs that Pazder saw in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That And the visuals are based on that too, that she thinks she says she saw are like these masks that he saw out there and like all other things. So, yeah. Which is also a little funny because um, the very, very bad exorcist too uh, pulls in a little bit of that. Not the well. worst one now. No. <laughs> <laughs> exorcist too, which somehow. No longer. <laughs> but yeah, that, that it, they uh, merged these different things to create this, overarching mythology would be a good word for it. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I mean, that's where their book comes out. There's, there's, they play back recordings of the tapes. But those could be hyped up and acted. It's, it's all audio. Yeah. You know, they could have had some before, but it's like, let's re record it, but do it like that, you know? Yeah. And like what? Michelle, when you see pictures of her before and stuff, all of a sudden she becomes this, like she ends up dressing for what like the like ideal conservative woman would look like. And then all of a sudden the women they start interviewing for them start looking like iterations of what she looks like. She's got that short curl haircut yeah. and that the covers that like, I mean, Amish women look like they're dressed in a bikini compared to what she's wearing. <laughs> like um, those dresses and stuff and like, what she's wearing feels like a costume almost. Yeah. Like the furled neck thing. And, yeah. And um, it, it, it's, it is very strange. And like you said, there is a uh, element of the costume coming in. Cause it is really mm -hmm. all theater. Yeah. And all of these cases that made it to, lawsuits and everything there are people that served real time and then got out but, yeah um and we talked about one of the california 
uh, daycare cases where there were 65 people or so that were accused. <laughs> Turns out they did catch one guilty guy, but it was just, yeah. it was just happenstance. He's like, oh, right. this, that guy was guilty, but, you know. Yep. It was an accident. We accidentally caught a guilty guy. <laughs> yes. But it wasn't even related to the stuff that they were. No. You know. Oh, totally so, true. Yeah. So, but the, the, uh, but it is like uh, Tina Fey made the joke to hosting the Golden Globes for the third time with Amy Poehler said um, this is an example of when Hollywood finds something that works a little bit, we they just keep doing it over and over until they're sick of it. Yeah. Because them hosting for the third time. But these people in the wake of, of Michelle Smith told the same story, basically. Every yeah. Time. And people interpreted it as, oh, it's the same story. It must be happening. As opposed to, it's the same fucking story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, yeah, and then there's like the stuff like yeah, there's the uh, the given birth and then sacrificing right away. Like, oh, there's, there goes the evidence. Like, um, it's like, I mean, a doctor could take a look and tell if she's given birth before, or you know, like that. And then there's the one thing like they sodomize my child. I'm like, okay, let a doctor look at his butthole and see what you know. Like, two seconds, they'll tell you no, nothing happened here. But, oh, yeah. there was the the thing because the, the, in the Michelle story. She had all this like fucking wicked shit happen to her, like physical like abuse. It's like a, a a saint came down and went like that, and she had her wounds healed. Like, yeah, that was part of the uh, thirty day ritual mm -hmm. that the Virgin Mary and Saint yep. Michael. Lama Mère. <clears throat> Which Michelle, do you speak French? No, I know I never spoke French. And then her sisters are like, she took French in high school and even won an award for it. Right, like. She but, knows but that, French. That that divine intervention removed all the wounds. Mm -hmm. so would be yeah. <clears throat> no evidence. But then, why is Mary speaking French? Right. Mary from the Middle East. Even <laughs> Mel Gibson made everybody speak Aramaic. And <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> well, right, yeah. It's yeah. It's weirdly distinct that every all they were all speaking French yeah. while in Canada. Because she yeah. Well, because uh, Canada, right? Yeah, but she's Canadian. Then. She would, she's Canadian. She would have some fluency in French, more than likely. <laughs> like that's and that's where the French comes from. That that would be it. Um, <laughs> now, now Michelle, well, Saint Nick. Yeah, Michelle did have. She was. Uh, she did have an alcoholic and abusive father. Her sisters can attest, but they their mother sounds like she was just poor poor woman. Very kind, just confused at why her daughter would accuse her of all the shit that was not happening. Yeah, that that's the uh, we can make light of, you know, the craziness of it or how people bought into it and how mm. people still buy into this stuff. But, but Michelle Smith's poor mother mm -hmm. had to sit there for years and years with my mother sold me to a cult. My mother yeah. this, my mother and that. died during the middle of all this too, right? Yeah, I, I think she did. And so it's yeah. just, you know, that poor woman. She just threw her on a metaphorical bonfire mm -hmm. to make herself famous. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, like, too, like the sisters talk about, like, yeah, we, uh, they, we go to San, we go to San Francisco, we rode limos and stuff, all because of this fucking book tour thing. It's like. Man, if you're really trying to get your point across, like, are you really like I I get like you need to let loose and relax and stuff, but it just sounds like someone taking complete advantage of this and the sisters asking her about this stuff and this not being like a hot topic of conversation. Like it's it's like I I have to wonder if the sisters are holding back from her telling them it's bullshit. And then something happened or something like that. I don't know. The kicker would have been if they got Michelle herself there, but yeah, that woman is not doing. Her. Yeah, they, they did, did ask. But she, for the obvious reasons. Because <laughs> for, for as unhappy as the sisters come across on this about it, like there's something in the middle they're not sharing. Like, because there's like details of their story about hanging out during this while their mother's being fucking viciously thrown to the wolves, like 
all across national television. Like, and nobody, nobody at this time, Oprah, your news thinks to talk to the family of her. No one, t- it's only, the, the focus is only Pastor Michelle and then whatever crazies come out of the woodwork to try to join in on the party. Like they never went beyond the people talking. Nobody came back until the courts had to get in and, you know. Well, th- this is kind of the definition of a, a witch trial in a way. And that mm-hmm. they, they so, I, I think there were a lot of people who enthusiastically wanted to believe that this was true. Right. And a lot of secondhand, maybe they were privately thrilled at the idea that the devil was real and here's our proof. It would solve a lot of problems. That's yeah. why the world is X. And, you know, the as we saw in, in recent years, Pizzagate and whatnot is just a bad cover version. Yeah. Of, right, right down to a lot of the same details. Mm-hmm. But people love to swallow bullshit especially if it's an alternative to eh, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> or or he made take responsibility money. or yeah, the world is what you make of it. You have to, you know, it can't be like, "Oh, that's why I sucked. Evil is real. The devil's real and it's doing, you know, or I can't progress in life because of myself, but I could say because I'm scared of Satan right now because if you go outside, you might get abducted and devil ritualistic abuse may happen to you yeah well just like it's like when trump's like if they do this to me think of what they could do to you i'm like i'm not ripping people off and doing like i'm not doing anything that would send me to the court like they literally have a case against you that's why you're going to court yeah and and there's also it's easy to fear monger with some of these things Mm -hmm. too i made a a passing reference to it, but um, most people who are reported missing yeah. are found. Yeah. Or turn out to not be missing. Right. And then the smaller percentage, it, it's less than 20%. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I did an article about uh, most mysterious disappearances, and I talked about some of the stats in there. But um, yeah, we talked about run, runaway train. <laughs> we right. talked about those kids. Yeah, yeah, people people get reported as missing all the time, but then turn up. And because they turned up, you know, the next day, five hours later, whatever, it doesn't mean that that report didn't exist. Mm-hmm. So when you say so and so many people are reported missing, they never say so many people actually go missing because that's a dramatically lower right. Thing. And then if you break it down, um, of the people that actually go missing, there's a vastly disproportionate number of indigenous women, black women, and Asian American Pacific Islander women that go missing versus white women and versus men mm-hmm. of any of those backgrounds. So really, if you're trying to make the satanic panic point, you don't want to point out any of that. No. You, you want the victims to appear to be mostly children and considering who's doing the reporting um, and the selling the story, mostly white, mostly middle class Christian anything it can happen to anybody except those people (laughs) (laughs) these people you know so it's and and so a lot of a lot of people that are real missing people with real problem Mm -hmm. people missing from their communities get underrepresented underreported and yet they're the ones that are missing more (laughs) right and and that that's the kind of thing that I always think of in these stats. It's just kind of crazy, you know. A parent can't find their kid. Six hours later, they haven't turned up. They missed a note. They missed a text. They forgot that the kid told them they were going somewhere. They report them. Six hours later, they turn up. That's still a missing persons case, even if it's closed. Mm-hmm. And so when, you, but when it parallels to the kind of stuff we're talking about, the number of children that had to have gone missing in Canada to have died at the rate that they die in Michelle remembers. <laughs> It's a lot. Tired. Like it's just like so many pregnant women giving these births and kids dying and people getting eat because they eat them or they do so, like you can't find the body. Of course they have the they have the best disposal system. Yeah, you know, I, <clears throat> it, it's hundreds. It's hundreds and hundreds 
Mm -hmm. uh, the body count of that that book would have been, yeah. you know, <laughs> filling up the, the Calgary Stampede stage. Right. Yeah. And it's funny, like, I think this, this I like, it's a prime example. This panic is like doing like of you can do all this damage that takes so long to unravel. There's still people that probably believe that the satanic panic was real or stuff like that. There oh, probably yeah. still are believe people now. that believe it now and stuff like, and just like, Oh, they got to them. They're covered. You know, the, the, the devil worshipers are there, but like it takes the damage got done and then it takes even longer. And the, the people who got off, like got out of it, like were accused, went to jail and stuff like, there's no the public retraction of that doesn't get seen by the most people. Most people saw the accusation, and so they're like labeled that for life. And it's a wonder when Michelle remembers comes out and then hits such a um stature right away that the like FBI or somebody didn't like immediately look into debunking it. You know, like why did they let it sit and fester? Which we see they didn't take it seriously, but when you have the potential for the public to, you probably should have stepped in and did like a, an investigation. Yeah. I well, I, I think too that I, I I can't say for sure. I don't know who was running the H the uh office mm -hmm. at that point. But like um who I don't know who the director was in nineteen eighty. What section yeah. of the bookstore did the uh the book go into? Did they do the Fox News thing of arguing like, well, it's fiction or it's yeah. entertainment? Because which is bullshit because you should be able to go, well, you're entertainment masquerading around as if you're news and influencing people. That that should be a, a thing, right? You shouldn't be able to like have a news station and then like that's clearly not parody. And yeah. And do that, but like I have to wonder, did they have the protection of that being in a specific section or categorized genre wise in a way that right. they could avoid court cases or things like that? But I would think like once it started hitting the circuit and you're seeing like people buy into it and another one, another case pop up, I'd be like, okay, let's debunk this shit. Yeah, um, William Webster was um, the uh, director then, and the devil, kind of, the devil and William Webster. <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting because the the like the thing that apparently is the highlight of his run is that he really encouraged the addition of female agents mm. because okay. Hoover had been notoriously anti female agents. So there was another director in between here because uh, Webster becomes in 78. Okay. So, but, so I don't know why they didn't get behind it and maybe, maybe they went and looked at it. We don't really know. It'd be kind of interesting yeah. what was going on there. Or maybe the FBI had other problems because quite frankly, America did have a pretty big serial killer problem. In the, I might in, take this one. Maybe, maybe Jesus was in their pockets. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, that that's now I'm now I'm very curious. That that is the oh it, probably the same. I'd have to look at the dates, but when uh, John Douglas and the guys were putting the behavioral sciences unit of the FBI together, uh, John Douglas is who wrote Mind Hunter. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and he is a uh, <clears throat> Joe Montagna's character on Criminal Minds is based on Douglas. Okay. So, so or, or do you think them trying to debunk it immediately would have only helped the Michelle Remembers cause? I think it probably would have possible too. That that could that could very well be it because you see that backlash with the QAnon and other batshit crazy mm -hmm. stuff now that's like Which yeah, let's Yeah, let's let's go like so this this thing ends on talking about how it didn't go away. It's still it's or it has made a comeback. Yeah. Well, and, and there, there's an element of fringe nuttiness about almost every people. Not just I heard it secondhand. I actually saw a person I know mm -hmm. uh, a few months back have a complete meltdown about Barbie was a weaponized thing to, uh, you know, make our. 
nope. feminized men and blah 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 and all this stuff and uh, people were trying to reason with her like that's not what it's about i was like have you seen the movie because that's not it yeah <laughs> and she kept saying this like no no have you seen the movie well like, and i and at the time i'm thinking I used to sit with this person in high school and talk about the Vampire Chronicles. Yeah. Like, we would be reading some of the same shit. It's like, what happened? What flipped that switch from I fucking love Anne Rice to Barbie is is feminizing our men? Right. There, I don't know what happens. I don't know what flips that trigger. Yeah. Well, and you know they they bring it to QAnon stuff, but I mean in the in the two thousands there was a little like not as big as what we see with QAnon resurgence, um, with the loose change of the nine eleven was an inside job stuff oh, yeah. is a kind of another form of this. Yeah, and... I've, I've always thought that um, the inside job was a little bit of reaction to um, people who are American exceptionalists not being able to handle the fact that we got our asses kicked by guys. Exactly. Box cutters. Yeah. They took the most low tech approach to hitting us as hard as they could because they had years to sit and think about it. Mm -hmm. And this is what they came up with. And they're like, we're going to fuck them. And in, in a sense, we've psychically never gotten over September 11th. Yeah, but that that has had massive repercussions for for all kinds of reasons. But like you said, the the conspiracy element of that, yeah, there was a conspiracy. It was Bin Laden's conspiracy, mm-hmm. and worked, and they fucked us. <laughs> yeah, he played a. It, it it looked like damage on one day that we came back strong as a, but we didn't. No, he did some irreparable damage to the psyche of our country, like. Well, the thing that I always found, uh, and, and going going back to the to to the applied rational thought to it, when all these people in the wake of it were saying, "No one could have ever imagined this," I was like, "Stephen King and Tom Clancy both imagined it." Yeah, the Running Man ends with Ben Richards crashing a plane into a skyscraper to take down the broadcasting company, and um, fuck, is it? Dead of Honor, whichever book that, in, that ends with um, the Japanese terrorists crashing the plane into the Capitol, mm-hmm. um, and Jack Ryan is still in the tunnel, so he survives, but like the Houses of Congress, everybody's wiped out, and he's the the next guy in line of succession, so he becomes yeah, 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 well, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, but Clancy and King, your two biggest fucking storytellers of you know the 80s and 90s like obviously best they thought of it they Mm -hmm. wrote it so i'm not saying it's their fault no but clearly someone thought of it 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 wasn't so far beyond the imagination it was you know what could we really do because they and not to mention the fact that milan's people had attacked the world trade center previously right they did the opposite they attacked from the basement Mm -hmm. didn't work now we're going to attack from the top aha <laughs> it's yep. kind of that whole that whole thing, but the the components of of believing the conspiracy. I think I've invoked this before. Alan Moore, uh, the great comic writer and all around weirdo, um, has said that uh, it's much more comforting to believe that there's a conspiracy that there's something there's some kind of plan behind everything because the alternative is there is no plan and we're completely alone and that's terrifying. Yeah. So I've always thought that there were a bunch of really scared shitheads who believed <laughs> really hard. Yeah. And... I, you know, I used to, I used to be big conspiracy theory, like if you go down those rabbit holes, things like that. But in my experience of life, like truth, most of the time is just boring and sucks. And it's just like, yeah, it is that lame of an answer for your disappointments. <laughs> That's yeah, pretty much. Yeah pretty much what it ends up being like once in a while you get something juicy like oh shit but yeah it's it's the other the other side of the sherlock holmes coin 
was that you know once you've eliminated all of the possibilities the remaining answer however unlikely is the answer well you never do eliminate all those possibilities right <laughs> they're just once you start going through that it's and it, the you know the the michelle rumors question when you have something like that first question is this person full of shit mm-hmm. is this person making this up why would they make it up well obviously attention talk shows etc and why would someone else make it up if the first person made it up because they saw the first person get talk shows attention and 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 whatnot well and you've seen like through social media like um i feel like a lot of the things in social media and granted we cultivate our social media around what we like in ourselves a lot of the time but i you know there's been a a thing called you know like trauma exploitation all over like people want attention for their traumas like yeah. and and they it's nice and i think it's great that people feel open and, and an avenue to share them but I also see them wanting to get the attention for it or seeing that you get attention for it. So there you go. I, I've got that. And there's also, um, I also think too, like, and I, I, you know, there's a click the A. I don't know if you've seen the film All of Us Strangers. I have not. But there's a scene where uh, Paul Mescal's character, when they're, first hanging out Paul Mescal and uh, Andrew Scott's character he's like are you are you queer he's like, oh yeah I'm queer he's like are you are you are you though or are you? and he's like no he's like because you know today and I'm like yeah that's what you see totally on because it I guess you know there's straight white people <laughs> that think it oh it's cool to be queer and they'll be like yeah I'm queer but you know I'm happily straight married to my wife or my my husband or whatever but so they can safely say that, but they're not, they've never had an experience. They can say, oh yeah, Chris Hemsworth's handsome because he is. And um, just tout it, but are never going to experience because they think, uh, I guess I want to be part of that crowd too. There's the FOMO with it as well. And I'm, and granted, and I feel so bad for those who are actually there. Right. And like, the, and they have to see this all fucking day. Like they, it's they not that a... easy to just say that and be that way, you know, like it's, and, and I feel like that lends itself here. It, it's an extension of that thing, but people that they're, they're like, Oh my traumas, or you don't know this or whatever. And then, um, and also the, the LGBTQ plus thing that is like, dudes, like you could be, it's a, they don't have a problem with you being straight. You don't have to, you know, like you don't have to be that to, you know, Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm square as hell, but I safely go home to my wife all the time. I don't cheat. I don't, you know, like, yeah, come on. Like, I think there is an element of, of some people want to, you know, like wear the t-shirt and yeah, and, and be part of a thing, but didn't kind of earn it by actually experiencing some of the awfulness that goes along. Right. Yeah, the, exactly. The uncertainty and everything. And, and you, you know, can, oh, it's, you can. Yeah, go tout it on social media. Try going out in like real life and live that. You know, the social media is an illusion. You could be a complete made up person there if you wanted. All your details are there, or what you're telling people, like Michelle here, and Michelle remembers. Like, I, I just, yeah, it's, it's a thing that had bugged me, irks me with social media stuff because I am myself, like when I go on these things, but a lot of people are not. Like, it's, and they follow these tribal waves of things. I've gotten myself caught up in like, you know, tribe like tribal movement, and I like it so bad. I'm like, no, stop it, fuck. But you know, I see it all the time with people. I'm like, I'm just like, oh fuck, shut up. And the people I know really well, I'm like, you are not. Stop it. Like, just yeah, you know. yeah. It it is, you know, how do I put it? This this kind of thing is is instructive mm -hmm. and i think that it's important when we've gone and looked at a lot of this stuff and i you know we get a good laugh out of some things about it and, mm -hmm. but we we also live through extensions of it so yeah uh, we do get a laugh ha because <laughs> we had right but you know the, the the flip side of that is i would hate for anything horrible to ever happen to a kid or somebody and them not be believed because there was so much other bullshit mm-hmm and and that yeah. would truly suck because agreed 
that but these weaponized very well thought out campaigns mm -hmm. uh, you know if if it really happens to to a kid they're not necessarily going to write a book about it they're right. going to struggle with who to talk to and maybe find an adult maybe they get an adult that believes them and maybe they get to a uh you know officer of the law who believes them and maybe they <laughs> get through the steps but that's not the kind of thing we're talking about here we're talking about as you said, opportunists. Most mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah, Did yeah. You, Believe you, me, folks. I'm not talking about the real. I, I like all the, uh, this. There's opportunists that come with it. In, in the very, in the smallest degrees of the dumbest shit, will be the opportunists as well. Like that's the thing. And and I'm and here in this, this space, like it's yeah. These oh, I was yeah Satan too. Oh, my child was fucking abused. Yeah, like what. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, and there, there is a, uh, there are some questions too that are kind of interesting that come up, and I, I've never seen people like ex fully explore them, but they are kind mm -hmm. of funny when you look at them. It's like, well, <clears throat> what was it about the '80s that there happened to be all of this stuff that was suddenly there for them to attack? That what well, we had the metal and horror stuff, like what had happened before yeah it brought all this stuff to the forefront and there's probably two things vietnam vietnam and well maybe three or four there's vietnam the um racial tension in the united states all the stuff that came out of that it was a really tense time you deal with tension with you know outlets mm -hmm. uh, and then the, there was the religious segment of it but there was also a pretty big horror boom in the sixties with hammer and everything mm -hmm. that fed a lot of the British metal bands. Right. You know, Black Sabbath is named after a horror movie. And Mario, Mario Baba's <laughs> Black Sabbath. Yeah. So, so, and, and a lot of bands were taking their cues from Black Sabbath. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, hell yeah. Fire and everything. That's fun. Let's do that. And yeah. th that's, so there was the thing and the horror, the horror novels were there. Horror novels go back centuries mm -hmm. so by the 80s you know uh, connor my, my son connor and i were talking about this earlier today with respect to different writers like genre versus people who think of themselves as serious um stephen king his first four books are gonna live forever yeah i don't know how many people are gonna be reading desperation a hundred years from now but carrie salem was a lot the shining of the stand are gonna stick around for fucking ever yep and and he wrote all those in the 70s. Yeah. And because King and Levin and Straub and all these people are having success in the 70s, they opened the door for everybody else, like Ramsey Campbell and all these other people to come in and Koontz and you know John Saul and then Robert McCammon and the 80s blow up because there's all these guys and ladies and rice they interview the vampire 76. You know, they come in and it's fully formed. Mm -hmm. in a way that where you had your harlan ellison's and your ray bradbury's and your stuff and your outliers there's like a movement now and right all young and they're all writing like crazy and you've got mall bookstores <laughs> and yeah you no know, boom so you get a you get a boom out of it and horror movies the same way into the 70s you get halloween you get friday the 13th Oh hell, we got a whole new subgenre. Yeah. Ooh, you know? And it it happened to all happen at the same time. And a lot of this stuff goes back to all the crazy social stuff with Vietnam, economic collapse, racial tensions, all the stuff that was baked in the culture finds expression. And it finds expression in music, it finds expression in literature, it finds expression in movies. So well, all the shit was going on. Uh -huh. And we have a lot of reactive stuff happening, plus also the tide of conservatism. Art's gonna push back against it. Yeah. And yeah. Well, and it's funny the art that that the slasher movement gets put as like, oh yeah, they were they were um preaching conservative values, you know, with like the sex stuff. Like, you realize the sex stuff is because where are you vulnerable as hell? You're naked, having intercourse and a kid like it's not saying like don't have sex, it's just saying that's a vulnerable position to be in if there's a killer around, which most of these people in those movies 
don't know there's a killer around. Yeah, there, there's like, two, there... it's so funny. Uh, they they push like the sex thing of those of like conservative values and like who goes through. Well, yeah, the nerds, the 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 shy girl's gonna make it. Like she's not, she's attentive. She's the one that's not doing anything at the party. She doesn't right. drink. Like there, well, you're getting victim because you're putting yourself in a vulnerable state, not preaching conservatism. Yeah, <laughs> it's well, so funny. If you look at the big four, uh, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, those people went in their house. Yeah. Yep. First of all, uh, Freddie, those are the kids of the people who killed him. He's out for revenge. Mm -hmm. Michael, Michael had some issues. He kills his sister. And then he comes back and he's killed the girls that are in the same houses. Yeah. So, And then Jason... Wasn't Jason in the first one? It was the mom, and yeah, it was sex related, but it was they weren't paying attention, and they said drowned. If they it went and played so tennis, crazy. same story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's it's an easy thing to throw that on, but when you look at the stuff, it's not really the thing that goes through the the chain, and that, that's the thing. Like we've talked about how ebert is great with like superhero and science fiction stuff it was unduly harsh on a lot of the 80s he liked horror but like the slasher stuff just threw him over the edge he like, liked like... carpenter he yep he liked halloween yep he was a big fan of halloween and that's completely outside of the you know he the... championed the movement and then was like god damn it like yeah. he, he crowned the one that's <laughs> yeah well it, it's really funny too to watch how his perspective changed in his great movie essays because he was one of the guys that was kind of like anti the thing mm -hmm. and then came around. But part, part of it was like the thing is one of those things, no pun intended, that you've never seen something exactly like it. So when you see it for the first time, it's like, holy fuck. And yeah, he doesn't process it. Yeah. In, in the right way. Um, but, you know, when my kids saw it, they've grown up with a lot of effects and everything. It's like mm -hmm. they, they really know that that's a thing, but just, I think they were more fascinated by that. How did they do that? Yeah. And that's like horror fans growing up. This is, this is in camera. How the fuck did that happen? And that's why we got so into horror back then. And that's how we grew up. Like horror fans always know the names of the effects guys and stuff like that. Because we're like, how would they do that? How they? And now it's just like CGI. <laughs> you know, like it, yeah. a lot of times. We had Fango too for that. Yeah. yeah. Like you would, you would see the stuff on the cover and it would be like, you know, the howling or whatever. And it's like, here's Rick Baker or Rob Savini, Nicotero, like all those guys, yeah. like, um, you know, uh, Steve Johnson, like just, they were rock stars because Kurtzman. it was like, how'd you do that? Yeah. Kurtzman, like, how, how'd you, how'd you do that? How'd you, you know, you know like that was the thing screaming mad George. Um, yes, they, they would do the, like, that was that was the thing like with horror like how'd you do that how'd you and then sci-fi to a degree was like who built those sets how'd they make that work but um oh yeah the the um the star wars cats Dennis smear and all those yeah guys, they were they were rock stars yeah and they, now it's just like you see guys sitting at computer screens you see the blue area they shoot the thing and like it's like it's all done it's all it, it kind of feel there's less of a um homegrown feel to it and more of a process uh like a oh. a conveyor belt way of doing effects yes but when done great they blow your mind i gotta say that's one thing i love about uh you know favreau and filoni although they have done the volume and all this really crazy advanced uh cg stuff mm -hmm. that in uh, season three of the mandalorian when they go into the the depths of mandalore they had phil tippett Come. yeah yeah and phil tippett designs all that shit and he makes real models and then they take the models and they they render them and they put them in the thing mm -hmm. and they've got like digital backgrounds but phil tippett made all of it yeah and it's like that's that's fucking awesome that's yeah. that's knowing where you came from <laughs> and right working it into a way that kind of honors all mm -hmm. of it and you know for sure we, we love those guys because you know and and this you know fango was on the the racks and parents were preventing their kids from buying yep. fango <laughs> because 
of stuff. I, I've, I've made it, I've made it the joke about it before. I remember mis distinctly being told I couldn't get the one with Tote's face melding. Oh, lost dark one that I wanted to get. That my mom was like, No, I'm like, We saw this movie, <laughs> like, you know what it is. It's right as the lost dark. And I was, I was told no because the cover, like, and years later, later, I worked for him. Ha, so ha, yeah. boom, <laughs> full circle, but, you know, but it is, but it is the the thing of it that it, it was a weird cultural time. And so all these things were finding expression, they just happened to be happening alongside whatever prompted her to tell that story at that time mm -hmm. opportunism whatever um yeah, yeah, yeah rosemary's baby too that was the catalyst that kind of pushed horror towards stuff and then the exorcist capitalizes on that religious horror which carries over that's that's presence present as yeah. well we, um, we would um maybe, maybe we should do an ira lovin episode sometime <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, Stepford Wives, Boys from Brazil. Look at all this stuff that he just dug into that was, you know, modern, mm -hmm. modern horror stuff that he just ripped open. <laughs> True. True. Yeah. Um, it, I I will say, uh, a guest a uh, guest of the show for uh, Molly Henry did see uh, this movie at the Portland Horror Film Festival. Um, and I wanted to pull from a review that she said that um, there were times throughout the screening where the audience laughed and there are definitely humorous moments, but it's mostly laughter coming from how outrageous the entire situation was. And yet there is also something inherently frightening about it. All it took was one book to become popular enough with enough people believing the contents for mass hysteria to take hold and ruin innocent lives. So, um, but yeah, just to see the people going, like you said, like I think one of our first conversations you you were teaching at the time, and you had students being like, "Did that really happen?" You're like, "Yep, <laughs> it wasn't funny to live in during the time." Yeah, and I actually recall uh, in that it was the uh, Mazes and Monsters one, I actually stopped and apologized for laughing halfway through because I'm like, sometimes that's the only way to to deal with it. Yeah, is to kind of laugh about it, like like, like they're anything funny inherently like oh satanic abuse oh that's hilarious and that's not the the funny part it's the funny part is like on the back end of mm -hmm. it you can see how ridiculous the the whole premise was and that people ran with it so wholeheartedly yeah and just just like the you know j just like the the thing of you know the 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 trump stuff that they refuse to acknowledge that Man, the Justice Department's been suing this guy for lawbreaking shit for fifty years. Yeah, first, first time he was uh, drugged into court over something was the discrimination and renting in nineteen seventy three. Right. Yeah. I mean, none of this is new. It, it, none of it, the, the SNL was making fun of him in the eighties with Phil Hartman and Jane. Right. Hook. They they weren't. Everybody knew who this cat was, and then suddenly this this figure emerges like it post the apprentice like what how the fuck does that even happen it's I, I remember back in the day growing up he was always on lifestyles of the rich and famous yeah that was like his show he would be a regular on yeah and so and and, and again for for the parallel right the the the, the epstein stuff where epstein mm -hmm. isn't questionably been involved in some really bad shit but the one person that's had his picture with that fucking guy more than anybody else is your <laughs> red hat hero. Yeah. Like there's video, video of him hanging out, right? Meanwhile, they're trying to pillory Tom Hanks, who no one's ever had any right of any crime. Well, right? that whole thing like... that whole thing was basically they took a list of names, asked people about those names, even if they weren't in corrupt, like George Lucas was in there just because they're like, did you see George Lucas there? And they're like, no. So then it gets recorded as part of the case. So then his name comes up in it. So a lot of those names were just random ones of celebrities and stuff that they came up with to ask people to corroborate. And they're like, no, and like, literally then they're like George Lucas in the, is in the documents in case of the, it's, it's stupid. Well, yeah. Well, in the, 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 George Lucas, after he and his wife got divorced, dated Linda Ronstadt for some time. So mm -hmm. good on you, George. Yeah. <laughs> Late 70s Linda Ronstadt? Good Lord. Yeah. This, this dude is, you know, 
I, I don't think that dude was going to a private island. Uh, but but it, it's also it just this this whole thing of it, you know I hate to hate to go to Hitler, uh, but the <laughs> biggest the, the biggest lie, like you you could tell the biggest lie and people will believe it. Yeah. That yeah. you know all of our problems are because of this people. All of our problems are because Satan. Yeah. <laughs> when what is Satan? Satan is these things I don't like. Yep. Exactly. No. Yeah. Exactly. Woke. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think we've covered this. Satan wants you, Doc. Pretty up and down. Or our, our yeah. Michelle remembers focus. Here. And I gotta say, once again, good on these guys for making this documentary because it's good that stuff like this happens that people will mm-hmm. tell these stories and dig into them because um, something that we'll cover in the future. You have these these documentaries like the one about Ed Lorraine Warren that is just completely unquestioned mm-hmm. um, celebration, like presenting everything as if it's all real yep. without any skepticism applied to it at all. Which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, Shock Docs, the true story of Ed and Lorraine Warren. The trailer. Yeah. Our, uh, I I guess that's, uh, to be punny, the uh, one we will conjure up next. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hauntings. Hauntings. (laughs) So, okay. Uh, Troy, uh, where can people keep up with you before? In the meantime, uh, between the, the now and the then. Post.com. You can find me all over social as myself, Troy Brownfield, um, and threads, Facebook, et cetera. So, but yeah, Saturday evening post.com. You can read my work on a semi regular basis. Most recently, I did an article um, on the boom in animal horror films of the 1970s. Oh, frogs. Frogs. I mentioned it. There you go. Uh, Manitou. <laughs> I did that. Are you say you're saying Native Americans are animals? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Although Manitou is is awesome, I, I really enjoy Manitou. Yeah, the like an Exorcist knockoff kind of what they're going for there. But but I really enjoy the the uh, end when you know Susan Strasberg is like they're in that like void region, mm-hmm. and just starts like shooting energy blasts. It stuff. is yeah, it gets nuts. <laughs> it gets nuts. I, I love it, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, uh, and I'm on uh, social media and Letterboxd at Brandon Four K U H D. Uh, reminder: the PopCon Indianapolis is right around the corner at the end of April, and you could submit a live recording for the live podcast stage, which I host, and would love to have your show up there. Uh, and you could also submit that same podcast uh, in the podcast awards which will be held that weekend at PopCon. So become an award-winning podcast. Uh, Check out popcon.us for the submissions for those and other information. Uh, Till next week, we talk about Ed and Lorraine Warren. Stay film positive. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetersshow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.